Welcome everybody to uh, Republic of West Florida Historical Museum in Jackson, Louisiana. Uh, Jackson is a very historic town and uh, it was basically founded in 1815 when uh, Andrew Jackson came back through here after the Battle of New Orleans and uh, he camped out on Thompson Creek which is only a mile from here and uh, he uh, uh, was uh, came through this way to pay his respects to people who had fought with him in the in the battle against the British, and and that that was uh, led to, you know, our independence from um, our European control, and uh, uh, Andrew Jackson uh, later became uh, uh, president of the United States, and 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 he he really helped us gain independence. So in our museum here, what we have tried to do, originally we wanted to have wildlife in this first room and we wanted to uh, show what the world looked like here. If, if settlers would come here and build a log cabin or build a house or something, and they look out the window and they see all this varied wildlife in Louisiana. So we have now really, really covered up most of the wildlife with other things. And one of our exhibits here that Billy Spadell um, got, was a, a gentleman had made a replica of the um, uh, Santa Maria, which was Columbus's uh, uh, ship that uh, in 1492, when the three ships came and, and we discovered the world was round, basically, and uh, that, that, that there was a, a, a civilization on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, really, it's important that, that young people take advantage of learning about our history so they won't make the same mistakes that we have made in the past and that they will understand where their roots are. Uh, this is a, a, a one good reason for having a museum, but to me, our museums are, are a wonderful learning tool. As we tour back through the museum, you, you're going to see uh, some items from the first railroad in the South, uh, which was the Clinton and Port Hudson Railroad. Uh, it was it was chartered in 1833, and uh, it it had a spur that ran to Jackson. And if you know where Millbank House is, which is only, what, three blocks from here, uh, that, they own that too, which was one of the first banks. And, and it had a spur that ran to Jackson. You'll see some of the original rails in the next room, which are over two, about 200 years old. And you see that it's a whole lot different from the I-beam rail that we use today. As you go through, uh, you will see that we have exhibits from throughout our history. We tried to do it in chronological order in a, in a way that this would be the first room and the second room was uh, uh, the uh, uh, growth of this community and this area with the uh, uh, beginning of, of Centenary College here uh, that takes their roots back to 1825, which was the College of Louisiana and it was located uh, only two blocks north of here. Uh, it had a magnificent center building, the uh, pictures in the next room, and, and you can imagine that it had an auditorium that seated 2,000 people, and you say it wasn't even 2,000 people in the town. And, and, and yet, it, it honestly, was bigger, Jackson was bigger than Baton Rouge at one time. And we had, a, we had a, a lot of settlers up here, and you say, why was it bigger in Baton Rouge? Look at the land in Baton Rouge and how low it is. Uh, actually, uh, at, at the time when the river gets up, a lot of it would be flooded if it, if it wasn't for the, uh, the uh, levees. And uh, up here was the beginning of the hill country. And so they, they uh, really settled an area that uh, they knew that they could form First, and this land here was more valuable than the land in Baton Rouge, and now, of course, it's the opposite, <laughs> opposite way. But, but that just shows you uh, what happens uh, uh, throughout history, and as time changes, 
how, how values change, how we look at things differently. But uh, come on and, and join us in a little, little tour uh, uh, as we go about our, our uh, journey in time here. One thing I, I would like to point out uh, uh, an exhibit uh, to my right is we had a, a very famous artist in our area, uh, John James Audubon, and he painted many of his Birds of America uh, from uh, li living here in the Feliciana area. And uh, this is his uh, uh, portrait up on the, uh, uh, to my right, up on the wall, and you'll see uh, 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 some of the birds that uh, are native to Louisiana in the exhibit here. As this area developed, uh, uh, Centenary College of Louisiana developed in 1825, and uh, it, it became a very prestigious school uh, before the Civil War uh, caused a lot of problems. And you, you will see uh, some of the pictures of a magnificent center building here of Centenary College. It, it had an auditorium that seated 2,000 people. It was one of the f biggest libraries, if not the biggest in the South. And it, it, it makes you wonder if we could have avoided the Civil War what our community and, wh and what our uh, state would be like because at the time uh, we uh, were involved in, in making large cultural strides in our area. One of the strides uh, was the, uh, the first railroad. We had the first railroads in Louisiana were chartered in 1833 and the Clinton and Port Hudson was one of these railroads. If you think about it now, if you think about it, between 1833 and 1903, guess what? T to move heavy loads, we didn't have automobiles and, and trucks. What well, we had to move them by steam power or steam locomotives. And it, uh, uh, down here, you will see the uh, some of the first rail that's almost 200 years old that was used in the Clinton and Port Hudson Railroad. They, they had a, um, a cross tie under the rail that was made out of cedar because cedar uh, uh, held up good, good against the elements. But you see that this is some of the, the original equipment from the railroad. And, and, and down here to my left is a, is a is a photograph of the first train we had was a Clinton and Port Hudson. Uh, you see, and P R H, Clinton and Port Hudson Railroad. The owners of the railroad had a had a had a spur that ran here to Jet Jackson, and and the first bank here in Jackson was also the owners of the railroad. So you, you see a lot of, lot of history uh, was tied up in a few people who, who were visionaries and had a, had a great idea of, of the, how we could develop this land to be prosperous and to be eco economically viable to, to our, our citizens here. But uh, oh, this is, uh, room is very interesting uh, if you take the time to visit things. We're going to go down the hall now to our uh, Civil War room. Uh, this is our, our Civil War room that, that, that picks some of the activities uh, uh, during the Civil War of the uh, clashes between the Confederate troops and the Union troops. Uh, uh, we had a large enclave of... of, of, of uh, Confederate troops that were controlling the river. And uh, you'll see a, a photograph uh, on, on the wall here showing that the Mississippi River is at the bottom and, and you see a few, a few ships there on the river. And you, if you look close, you can see a, a railroad track. And, and that's where the Clinton and Port Hudson actually ended there. And at that time, they were, were having using the railroad to, to bring cotton bales uh, to, um, to the river to put on a steamboat uh, to enter international trade. And, and this was very profitable uh, for, for the people of this area. 
And so you, you say uh, the Civil War was, was uh, a war about slavery. It was also uh, about economics. Now, this area here is, is going to show you some ordnance that was used uh, during the fighting of the Battle of the Civil War. And you, you can see the cannonballs, how big they were, and how destructive they were. And it, it ended up that it, it, it really knocked almost every growing tree down in the area. Uh, the, uh, the troops were bunkered behind mud uh, berms, and, and they uh, uh, fought off the, the Union troops uh, until they were finally starved, starved out. And when General Grant uh, took Vicksburg, they knew that it was inevitable that the Port Hudson would fall. And at, at that time, uh, uh, they decided to, to surrender. But it was very interesting because uh, we had a, a volunteer that showed how Port Hudson looked after the battle. And it, uh, it, to my left is, is a depiction of the, uh, the battleground after the battle. Uh, and it, it showed how devastating it was. It, this is originally mud from take it from Port Hudson. We had a volunteer that came up here who was an expert on Civil War history, and he camped out here two weeks and slept in a sleeping bag on the floor, and he put this exhibit together for us. We're deeply grateful for that. We have uh, uh, all kind of uh, muskets and and uh, ordnance that was used uh, uh, during our, our Civil War. In a number of cases here, uh, we have a, a depiction here by former chancellor of LSU, uh, Bud Davis, of uh, uh, a lot of our Civil War activity. Uh, uh, Bud was just a prolific, prolific uh, producer of these small uh, lead figures that he painted and, and uh, uh, really depicted the the tremendous battles that we had uh, during our, our Civil War period. Another interesting thing for, uh, that you find in our museum is a, a, a story about uh, General Neil Dow. General Neil Dow was from Maine, and he was one of the uh, Union soldiers that was involved in the siege of Port Hudson, and they said that he was, he was possibly the, the smartest guy uh, who was a general for, for the uh, uh, Union troops. Uh, this is his picture up, up to the left. That's General Dow. But, but he, he was uh, feeling very secure during the uh, siege of Port Hudson. And he uh, actually was staying in, in a plantation home there. And, uh, Colonel McEwen, whose picture is right next to General Dow up here, was, was fighting for the Confederacy. And he, he belonged to the um, units in, in Virginia, but he was home on leave. And, and somebody said, well, you know, we ought to capture some of these generals. They didn't, they, they didn't say we ought to kill them. He said, well, we ought to capture some of them. So Colonel McEwen, being home on leave, and this was his home territory, he gathered up four or five of his friends, and they slipped in down a ravine and a creek bed, and they slipped up to the home where General Dow was staying, and they said, we're going to capture this general. And they rushed inside, and lo and behold, the general was not at home. And that, that, that was uh, about six or seven o'clock at night. And, and they said, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to be risk, risk being captured or killed ourselves because we're surrounded by Union troops. And they said, uh, can, we, can we wait it out until he comes in? So they voted to, to wait it out. About 10.30 that night, 
General Neil Dow rode up on his white horse with his sword at his side, and they slipped out of the bushes and put a pistol up to his head and captured him and tied him up and, and, and put him back on a horse and, and led the horse back down through the ravine and the creek, creek bottom. And he was, he was sent all the way to Richmond, Virginia, in exchange for a prisoner exchange from Robert E. Lee, who was the second son of Rooney Lee, who was the second son of Robert E. Lee. But anyway, Colonel McEwen captured his sword and, and this, in this exhibit, it shows a picture of the McEwen family, one of the members of his family, holding his sword. It's in a bank vault in Baton Rouge and it's still owned by the McEwen family today. Also, you'll notice in this exhibit too, there's a copy of a book called Celine, uh, Remembering Louisiana. And uh, Celine actually was a young lady uh, a teenager who lived in Jackson, and uh, during uh, during uh, the uh, skirmish of the, the uh, uh, Civil War t troops, and uh, as she uh, writes in, in this book about the, uh, the 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 times that they had to hide in the closet and for fear that they would be killed by the stray bullets, and it, it's very very interesting. But it it, it really gives you an, a picture. Of a, of a teenager growing up here in the town of Jackson during the time of the battle. Now we're going on to the uh, next exhibit, which brings us up to uh, uh, the 1900s. Uh, we think this is a very interesting exhibit for our museum. Uh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, who uh, made the uh, famous solo flight across the Atlantic in 1927, uh, ended up being a great hero. But, but two years before that, he, he was a, a barnstorming pilot. Uh, he loved to fly, and he uh, would fly around into different areas in, the, in our country. And uh, he would, uh, uh, to defray his expenses, he would uh, take people up for, for an, uh, in his airplane for $5. And you can imagine $5 was a heck of a lot of money in those days. In fact, that was probably a a week wages or maybe two weeks wages for some people. But anyway, he, uh, he landed in this area over near, near Clinton and uh, he had some problems with his, um, with his plane and in Jackson, uh, they worked on uh, the armature that, that, that provided the spark for his engine uh, down here in, uh, in, in, in the McEwen building that, uh, that houses the gumbo kitchen of the Jackson Assembly. But anyway, it, you will see uh, over to my right a propeller that came off of his airplane. He was giving airplane rides, as I said, for $5 each in Clinton. And uh, the plane was sitting idling there as he changed passengers. And this lady came up with this big collie dog, and this dog started barking at the airplane, and and and, and barking at the propeller as it it, it it kept turning around. And finally, the dog got too close to the propeller, and the propeller hit the dog and killed the dog. Uh, but it it destroyed destroyed the propeller too. So he spent Lindbergh spent three days, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Wrist Hotel over in Clinton, Louisiana, our neighboring town, and he uh, had to wait till they shipped him a new propeller by rail. And it, it, it's amazing that, that this propeller has been pre uh, preserved uh, even though it, it's, it, it's broken and we have a picture of the uh, lady who was, who had saved it all of these years and she had donated it to our museum here in Jackson. You know, it's wonderful to see the innovations that we made in a, in a, in a period of a, a, about a, a, a 150 years, but it's, it's very interesting to see where we have, we have gone from a, from an agrarian society to a technology uh, 
driven society in, in almost just two lifetimes. And uh, uh, that's why we need to understand where we have been for young people to have a, a progress report to where we're going in the future and to appreciate uh, that we stand on the shoulders of the people that have gone before us and made tremendous sacrifices for us to live in freedom here in America because America is unique in the world. Uh, we are sought after so many countries would give up their citizenship in their home country in a second and, and want to live in our country. We need to appreciate this and we need to build on this and say, let us, let us help other people so that they can help themselves. And, and let us set a good example here by working hard and educating our young people and, and, and having them to understand that they're not here by accident, but they are here because of the people who have paid a heavy price for them in the, in the past. We are delighted to point out a replica of Henry Ford's first car before he, he built the Model T. And, and, and as many of you know, uh, if you've ever been to the uh, Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, we, ha we had the opportunity, my, my family had the opportunity to visit several years ago, and it really knocked our socks off. It was so good. Uh, uh, about how Henry Ford developed his first engine, and he, they called it the, the kitchen sink engine, and it, it was about as big, big as my hands are spread apart here, and uh, he actually got it to run, and up there today, if you visit that area, uh, you, uh, they have two or three of these little small engines that, that they demonstrate it and show you. But what a wonderful part of history Henry Ford was, and Thomas Edison, and the Wright brothers that brought us almost into a, a, the space age uh, that we uh, live in today, and, and the age of, uh, of Google and Amazon and all of the things that, that drive our economy today were based on the fact that the people gave a great deal of their effort to, to make wonderful things happen. And our museum is a depiction of that. We have several Model T cars here. We have some old equipment. We have an old uh, uh, stove. Uh, we remember we had to, had to uh, cook years ago on, on a wooden stove. And, and, and now today, nobody thinks about that. They just turn on the switch and the power comes on. So we're delighted that, uh, that y'all have taken this time to uh, view our a video of uh, our museum. Uh, we have some outbuildings. We have a, uh, one building that has an old grist mill. We have an, a, another building that has a, a 1880s uh, cotton gin. And uh, we had uh, the largest gin works in the, in the world located here in Amit, Louisiana, which is part of the Florida parishes. And uh, at one time, and of course that building has been torn down, but we have uh, uh, the real gin here at our museum. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibit of, uh, of miniature trains in, in the back and, and almost every Saturday, uh, uh, the exhibit is open for you to visit that. But we encourage you to uh, bring your friends and family to come to visit our museum and learn and be a part of Louisiana history and American history that, that can make a difference to uh, our young people of America and the world. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.